All right, and Nelson's on there. Maybe I'll wait a few more minutes. No, wait, I have it on recording now. <laughs> so I can't, I can't wait for a few minutes anymore. All right, so I've been doing a series of, of Bible studies on a very confusing topic. And uh, normally what I do, I, I, uh, I, I guess it has something to do with the Torah readings because the Torah readings are focusing now on comfort, which has everything to do with uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. And so um, I want to put some reminders here before I go into this because I know that uh, people in the Worldwide Church of God, Splinter Church, is that they, they're not really uncomfortable about what I'm going to talk about. But there's, uh, there's other Messianic Jews in particular, uh, also some people in the Hebrew Roots Movement, they may get a little... Uh, confused of the reason why I'm going to do a study on the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, first of all, I, I know some of you, uh, or maybe all of you, have heard of Eddie Chumney before. Uh, Eddie Chumney, uh, I've met him personally, um, and he also knows Yer Davidi. If you don't believe me, do a Google search. Matter of fact, I'll do one right now so you can see that he's given a series of studies on the tribes. So it's not like I'm the only one talking about this. Uh, somebody who's a lot more popular than me has been doing it for several years. Uh, let me type him up here. Eddie Chumney, Year of Davidi. Okay, you see this right here? Um, you have a series of, of uh, videos of Eddie Chumney talking to Year of Davidi about the tribes, out of 10 tribes, and he believes like I do about the tribes. So, if you need some credibility about what I'm talking about, then that's it. All right. What I'm going to do is give a series of studies on the tribes because I really feel it's time for people to understand who these tribes are. Um, and I'm going to show you biblical proof of that. I'm going to go over that again. And we really, really need to know where they are located. And some people say, well, this has got to do with salvation. Well, it has nothing to do with salvation, but it has something to do with the following scripture here. Uh, and second... Uh, Peter chapter 3 it says but grow in the grace and knowledge of our master Yeshua Messiah we all understand at least I hope we all understand that he's Yodeh okay the son all right so uh, we need to grow in grace and knowledge part of that growing in grace and knowledge is understanding who these tribes are today now I doubt if we all know 100% where all the tribes are, but we can estimate. Now, a few, uh, quite a few of them, we know who they are, all right? And so I just want to put a disclaimer out there, but we know where they, they went. That is certain, 100%, and where they are scattered across the world, all right? So, and that is what we're going to talk about today. And, and after I get through with this study, uh, that's where I'm recording it, uh, and it's going to be uploaded on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. And it's going to be on a playlist. Uh, all the tribe is going to be, what's the title of the playlist? Let me see if I can find that. <laughs> uh, let me see. So here's Eddie Chumney. So feel free to go over what Eddie Chumney uh, talked with uh, Yer Davidi about. All right. So because he believes like I do. All right. So I just wanted to point that out to you. This is not some strange thing that no one in the Hebrew Roots movement have, have talked about. All right. So uh, let me go to. And here's the playlist. I have two of them so far. Now, the playlist that uh, this is going to be uploaded to is the identification of all the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, I have a video that I just did. Oh, wait, this is the photo. Let me see. No. Let me go back here. Um, America is Manasseh. So I, I identified that using your Davidi's material and other material that I've had, biblical. So if you want to go over that video, uh, that comprehensive video that will show you uh, that Manasseh is America, then or uh, means that the majority of Manasseh is America, okay, or America is a Manasseh, whatever, uh, go ahead and, and look at that video. And prior to that, I gave an introductory video, an introduction to the 12 tribes of Israel. That's it right here, Shabbat Shazan or Chazan, rather, Shabbat Chazan, the Sabbath of Vision, which focuses on the tribes, all right? So that's, that's interesting. Torah readings actually focus on this concept of Israel. And so I guess this is a good time to start doing it. 
uh, doing these studies. All right, so I just wanted to point that out. And another thing I want to point out is what I'm going to talk about today is prophecy. And Paul gave us um, a warning about our attitude about prophecy. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he tells us right here, despise not prophesying. Okay, so that's in the word of God there. And despise simply means uh, let me look at theirs. It means uh, to despise utterly, to treat with contempt. So we, we should not. I remember a young lady that uh, was in my congregation a few years ago, and she every time I started talking about prophecy, she just <laughs> she just couldn't handle it, you know. And so uh, we can't be that way, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the twelve tribes certainly has a lot to do with prophecy. And if we claim to, to be spirit-filled or have God's spirit, we shouldn't resist prophecy. And in Revelation 19, verse 10, it says, And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See, do it not. I am thy fellow servant and thy brethren that have the testimony of Yeshua. So what is that? What's the testimony? What is it composed of? Worship Yodevahe, for the testimony of Yeshua is what? The spirit of prophecy. And so... That simply says that we, if we claim to be believers, then we should not be afraid of prophecy. I know we all want to hear the good news prophecy, but sometimes we have to listen to the bad, well, actually not sometimes, we have to also listen to the bad news prophecy because the bad news prophecy gets us to the good news prophecy. <laughs> okay, so, so we can't pick and choose what prophecies we want to adhere to and, and, and listen to. We have to listen to all the prophecies of the Bible if we claim to have the spirit because part of having the spirit is linked with prophecy what is prophecy prophecy is future history it's future history um that's going to lead to a wonderful wonderful time and so we, we should not uh, be afraid of prophecy or anyone preaching prophecy and we should feel comfortable about hearing prophecy because prophecy is a very significant part of the bible ladies and gentlemen and so uh, there's a there's a here, here's right here. I'm going to quote this in the complete Jewish Bible version so that, that it's a better Hebraic understanding. It says, without a prophetic vision, the people throw off restraint. Or the King James Version says, they perish. But he who keeps Torah, and part of keeping Torah is understanding the prophecies, ladies and gentlemen. The Jews have a section called the Chatar section. It's the prophetic section. So, um, and then in the, in the first century, Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 13, it talks about the first century church and what they did. They read out of the, um, the law and the prophets, if I can find this here. All right, let me type this in here. This is in the wrong version here. To find this law prophets here we go it was in the right chapter I just didn't know where the verse was at <laughs> all right so uh, I think so they should be able to can you see the screen Desiree you should be able to see it Is everyone seeing the screen? So let me know. All right, so uh, Acts 13, verse 15 states the following. This is where Jews were doing this in the first century. <clears throat> they were doing the um, three-year cycle. <clears throat> okay, everyone sees. <clears throat> All right, great. And I'm going to record this, too, for those who uh, have missed this for whatever reasons. Okay, so... Um, who else is seeing it? Everyone, I did. It's, it's me then. Oh, it's you. Okay, I don't know what's going on with your screen. Um, hopefully you can get it fixed up there. All right, so Acts 13, verse 15. And after the reading of the Torah and the prophets, okay, the rulers of the synagogue. So that's what they did. This is a, a scripture to prove that they actually did do the Torah readings as early as the first century, actually earlier than that. And then what they did, they did a three-year cycle. 
And then uh, later on, they convert over to a one-year cycle, which most of Judaism and, and most of people in the Hebrew Roots movement and, and other people that follow the Torah readings adhere to. So you did eat. Good. All right. What did you eat, Nelson? <laughs> anyway. All right. So um, so I, I just want to focus on the fact that let's, let's not get uh, a bad attitude about prophecy, not that I'm asserting anyone's having a bad attitude. I'm doing this also for the people that's going to be listening to this, because uh, some people that may listen to this may not like prophecy. Okay, so that's the reason why uh, I, I just wanted to quote those scriptures so that you, you would uh, uh, not be afraid of prophecy and, and, to, and to listen to the prophecies and, and, and to take here to it. All right, so anyway, last week I talked about America and, and, and the fact that uh, more than likely they are Manasseh. All right, and I gave proofs of that. You need to look at the other video that I did because I don't have time to go over that today. So right now I'm going to focus on the mother country of America, which is Britain. Okay, I'm going to focus on that today. And Genesis 35, this is the scripture I wanted to quote last week, and for some reason I couldn't remember it. But it states here, and Yodevai, he said unto him, I, El Shaddai, that's what it means in Hebrew, English, God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. I am El Shaddai. Okay. Be fruitful and multiply a nation. So that's a goy in Hebrew. And a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. Now I want to focus on the king part. <laughs> okay. And it says right here be fruitful and multiply a nation, and a company of nations shall be of thee. And kings shall come out of thy loins. Okay, so um, I proved to you last week that that nation is talking about the United States, all right, of America. And the nation that came from, uh, that America came from was, of course, Great Britain, which is a company of nations. A company of nations so we're going to go over that today but this is a foundational scripture to help you understand or to give you the guidance to understanding that America is Manasseh and and uh, Britain is Ephraim now here's another scripture in Genesis chapter 40 uh, 48 Genesis chapter 48 Genesis chapter 48, verse 14. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim, head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Yosef and said, Yodevahe, before whom my fathers Abraham, Isaac, did walk, the Yodevahe which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads and let my name so his name was placed his name israel was placed on ephraim and manasseh i want you to notice that okay so his name was stamped on them okay and the name of my fathers abraham isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth all right and when yosef saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of ephraim it displeased him the reason why it displeased because ephraim was the younger he wasn't the older, okay? And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head and to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand. So he wanted him to put the right hand on the oldest, Manasseh. But this is the reason why he didn't do it. In verse 19, And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother, shall be greater than he and his seed shall become a multitude a mellow of goin okay a multitude of nations okay and so and he blessed them that they saying indeed shall israel bless saying god make thee as ephraim and manasseh and he said ephraim before manasseh so ephraim was going to be blessed before, you know, as far as having the birthright, I'm going to explain what that birthright blessing is here in a minute. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, anyway, 
let's get to that. And we all, I hope we understand what the, let me go over the birthright. Genesis chapter 25. So Esau originally had the birthright, okay? And in verse 29, and Yaakov saw pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Yaakov, Feed me, I pray thee, with the same red, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob says, Sell me this day thy birthright. Okay, okay, so what is this? We're going to get to this in a minute. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Yaakov says, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Yaakov. Then Yaakov gave Esau bread and pottage of the lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way because Esau despises his birthright. It's too bad because he lost out. And let's take a look here at what happened here. Because... Genesis chapter 48. And right before Isaac died, let me go, go to this here in a minute. Let's see. All right, so this is what happened here. I have to give you a little background here on the birthright. Okay, so, and it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son and said unto him, Behold, my son, here I am. And he said, Behold now, I am old, I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, and so forth, and make me savory meat, that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. All right? And so it was supposed to go... The blessing, the birthright blessing was supposed to go to Esau, but you know what he did? He sold his birthright. And so God honored that, and he gave the blessing to Jacob, and he, he allowed these things to happen for that to occur. And so, and Rebekah heard when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt for the venison. And Rebekah spoke unto Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison, and make me savory meat, that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am smooth man. My father, peradventure, will fill, will fill me, and I shall seem to him to be as a deceiver and that shall bring a curse upon me and not a blessing and his mother said unto him upon me be thy curse my son only obey my voice and go fetch them and he went and fetched and brought them to his mother and his mother made savory meat such as his father loved and Rebekah took goodly raiment of the eldest son Esau which were were for in her house and put them upon Jacob her younger son and she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck and she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. And he came unto his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am. Who art thou, my son? Because he could barely see um, Isaac here. And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau. So he lied to him. I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my ventian, that my soul may bless me. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou has found it so quickly, my son. And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. And Isaac said unto Yaakov, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether you may uh, 
be my very son Esau. So he kind of suspected something there in verse 22. And Yaakov went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice of Yaakov's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. So he was still suspecting something. <laughs> and he discerned him not because his hands were hairy as his brother's Esau hands, so he blessed him. And he said, Art thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am, so another lie. Verse 25, and he said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's venison, uh, venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat, and he brought him wine, and he drunk. And his father Isaac said unto me, Come near now, and kiss me, my son. And he came near, and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment, and blessed him, and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the master has blessed. Therefore, Yod, if I had give thee of the dew of the heaven. All right, let me slow this down. This is what the birthright blessing composed of. Therefore, Yod, if I had give thee the dew of the heaven, the fatness of, or the best of the earth, and the plenty of corn and wine. And so this birthright blessing consisted of the best of the world's resources. Let people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee. This is a prophecy. Be Lord, over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curses thee, and blessed be that everyone that blesses thee. People always refer that to just Judah. It's referring to all the tribes of Israel, not just Judah. Okay? Um, and it came to pass, as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing to Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. And he also had made a say. So anyway... And then, of course, um, and Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who there is that had taken events and had brought it to me and have eaten all before I came? And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me, even now also my father. And he said, Thy brother came with subtlety and has taken away thy blessing. He, well, he, uh, he took away his blessing, but Esau made a deal with Yaakov or Jacob to sell his birthright. So God honored that, all right? In verse 36, and he said, Is it not he rightly named Jacob? For he supplanted, that's what Jacob means, me these two times he took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. That goes along with the birthright. And he said, Has thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said, Esau, behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given him for service, and with corn and with wine I have sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, and my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac, his father, answered and said, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth, and of the dew of the heaven from above. And by the, thy sword thou shalt live, and shalt serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass, when thou shalt have dominion, thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. And so many Jews believe that Esau consists today of, um, of what became the Roman Empire and also other powerful Gentile nations uh, uh, of today. But that's another Bible study. And so anyway, getting back to my uh, main model or paradigm that I'm using today. Uh, the fact of focusing on Ephraim and Manasseh and the blessings uh, that they got. Now, remember that Ephraim and Manasseh are, is, is Joseph's sons, okay? And they are considered one tribe. Actually, there's 13 tribes. And um, uh, Ephraim became the 13th tribe, okay? Because he was a younger brother of Manasseh. And so anyway, let's get back to the blessings of Joseph here. So Joseph is a fruitful ball, a fruitful ball by a well, branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty Yaakov or of, of Jacob. I mean, uh, Yodivahe of Jacob. Got me a comment here. Okay. All right. So I, I'm recording this, Deborah. So uh, if something happens, then it'll be on YouTube and pray that nothing happens. And I want to focus on the stone of Israel. I don't want to focus on it today. I don't know if you guys ever heard of the stone of scone, but this is what the scripture is talking about here. But his bow abode in strength 
and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty uh, Yodevahe of Galco from since is the shepherd the stone of Israel and like I said that's another Bible study I'd probably do a separate teaching on the stone of scone and its significance but anyway most people don't have a clue about that I certainly didn't um, before um, God revealed it to me and so uh, but it, it is some really really um, great knowledge verse 25 and by the Yodevahe of my father who shall help thee and by Almighty who shall bless thee with the blessings of heaven above the blessings of the deep that lie underneath the blessings of the breast of the, and of the womb the blessings of thy father have prevailed above all the blessings of thy progenitors unto the uttermost bound of the everlasting hills so Joseph was blessed with the best I want you to understand that Joseph received the birthright he did not receive the scepter what is that let me explain that in a minute here all right and on the crown of his head of him that was separate from his brethren. All right, so let me go to another scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 33. And this is um, Moses also blesses the tribes here. And at first it was uh, Israel, now, now Moses. Now here's Joseph again. Here's the description of Joseph. Blessed of the Lord be his land for his precious things of the heaven, for the dew, for the deep that crouch beneath, for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun, and for the precious things put forth by the moon. And for the chief, he gets the chief things, the best things of the ancient mountains, and for the precious things of the lasting hills, and for the precious things of the earth and the fullness thereof, and for the good will of him that dwelt in the bush. Let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. His glory is like the first thing of the bullock, and his horns like the horns of the unicorns. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. And they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. And I showed you guys that there's quite a bit of biblical imagery attached to the coat of arms of the United States, and the United Nations and Yehuda and, and probably all the rest of the tribes. But you can see here, you can write this down. Joseph, the imagery that is descriptive of Joseph is identified with the coat of arms of the United States and the British people. That's the UK coat of arms there. You see the unicorn. You see the lion. Uh, you see the, the United States coat of arms. You see the eagle. The eagle is described about Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and other parts of the Bible. But I have the scriptures there for you to see there. Deuteronomy 32, verse 9 and 11. Deuteronomy 33, verse 13 and 17. Now, some people that are, have just popped on here or uh, you people over the Internet, first time listening to me, I'm like, well, how are you using coat of arms to identify? Okay, well, here, here, let me look at the scripture. Let me quote a scripture to you here. With prophecy in particular, you have to apply this. It is the glory of Yodevahe to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings to search it out. And so with prophecy, you have to search things out. Let me give you an example. In uh, Daniel chapter 7, it talks about four beasts. All right, let me just show. I'm not going to go into detail identifying. I know I, I have a good hunch of who these four beasts are, but uh, it gives you a description of these beasts. All right. The first was like a lion. And had eagle's wings and all that. And the second one was like a bear. Third, like a leopard. Okay. And the fourth one was dreadful and so forth. All right. And he said, I beheld to the thrones were cast down and so forth. And so he says right here, I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came and so forth. And then here the, the angel gives him a, an interpretation but he doesn't give him a detailed interpretation he says these great beasts which are four are four kings which shall rise out of the earth and so these kings during the time of Daniel did not rise yet and every prophetic prophecy teacher thinks that these are just the four four kings that are identified in Daniel chapter 2 no I, I really believe that the foundation of those four kings are the ones that's identified but it's talking about a future time it says, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. 
but so they haven't rise, they haven't risen out of the earth yet at the time when Daniel wrote this. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. Okay, and so that's just an example, and I'm just wetting your appetite. I will give a video teaching on who those four beasts are, those four kings. Okay, so anyway, uh, I'm not going to do it now, though. But I'm just giving an example of how we got to dig and 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 go through history to identify certain prophecies, and that's what I'm doing here. Okay, so I just wanted to point that out how I do that. All right, so I'm, I'm going to talk about that in some future uh, story. And if you already heard of it, that's fine. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's nothing wrong with going over it again. Okay, so let's uh, go back to um, – sometimes I just think the Hebrew Roots movement is a movement of – I want to hear something new all the time. <laughs> we got we got to understand – what we already know, you know, before we get get off into some new thing, you know. But, but there's nothing wrong with new thing, but we got to make sure we understand what we already know, and we have to apply what we already know, you know. And, and that and that's the thing that uh, I just hope that everybody improves on in the Hebrew Roots movement, uh, and I and, and it's prophesied for people to improve on that. All right. So anyway, where am I? All right. So I'm going over all the, the, the tremendous blessings that Joseph, the tribe of Joseph, receives because they they hold the birthright blessing. The birthright blessing has nothing to do with salvation, but everything to do with prosperity, okay? Uh, all right, so here's the description of Judah. And we're going to get into Judah maybe next week, okay, uh, the tribe of Judah. But anyway, here's what the Bible talks about as far as Judah is concerned. Genesis 49, verse 8, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise, Thy hand shall be in the neck of thy enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is the lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse? And now the scepter, and this, and this Hebrew word, Shabbat, can refer to the tribe. The tribe shall not depart from Judah. This is the reason why everybody identifies the Jews with Judah, because their tribe, people always remembered what tribe they came from, or where they came from. I know the Jews understand that they're from Judah, uh, some sect of them anyway, okay? But this is saying that people would identify Israel with Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver. So they were also the teachers, the primary teachers, from between his feet. And to Shiloh, which means Messiah shall come, and unto him shall be the gathering of the people. So, He says right here, uh, binding his fold into the vine and his ass coat into the choice wine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white as milk. And so what does Moses say about Judah? Deuteronomy chapter 33. The Jews of Judah, and I'm going to prove that next. Some people don't, don't understand that. And I will prove to you uh, either next week or the following week or whenever. So it, but anyway, um, Where is Judah on here? You have Jess Room, Reuben, Levi, uh, Benjamin, Joseph, Zebulun, Dan, Asher. Where's Judah at? Man, Judah should be on here somewhere. Natalie, Zebulun, Benjamin, Jacob, Levi. Here we go. And this is the blessing of Yehuda. And he said, Hear, Master, the voice of Yehuda, and bring him to his people. Let his hands be sufficient for him, and be thou a help for him from his enemies. So that, that's the, the blessing of, uh, of that. And now, here's a scripture that will help, I hope, explain this about the birthright here. All right. So First Chronicles 5, verse 1. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel. So, so Reuben was the firstborn of Israel. For he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed. Okay? So let's understand this. Yosef, okay, Jacob, got the blessing from Esau. Okay? And the, the birthright was laid upon Joseph. All right? 
So the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, and the reason why is because Reuben, what did he do? For he was afraid, but he defiled his father's bed. His birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph. So Reuben should have got the birthright, but he didn't from, from um, Jacob. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. So no, no genealogies is reckoned after the birthright. Now you know what the birthright is. The birthright is physical prosperity, blessings, the best of the resources, okay? In other words, you got the money, okay? <laughs> Verse 2, for Yasuda prevailed above his brethren, and of him he became the chief ruler, but the birthright was Joseph. Now remember I showed this scripture where it says king shall come out of you, okay? When, when it was associated with um, Ephraim. Let's go over that again. Okay, so let's let's look at this pivotal scripture again. And Yodevahe said unto him, I, El Shaddai, um, be fruitful and multiply a nation, and a company of nations shall be of thee. Okay, and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings, I want you to notice that, kings shall come out of thee, an aristocracy, okay, all right, so let's, let's focus on that a little bit more, and then I'm going to focus on some other things too, but let's go over something here. I pretty much covered everything at the birthright blessings here. And all right, so the prophecy also says that these will grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. This was a global promise. This is from um, Peter Salemi's uh, booklet on USA British and Prophecy. I, I do use stuff that I don't have to rewrite, so it can save me time. This was a global promise, as the New Testament says, that Abraham was promised that he should be heir of the world. So this promise was global, not just in Palestine. Where in the world does one look to find nations that match this description, brother nations, enjoying long-lasting relations with each other, even though brothers sometimes fight? Two great peoples possessing between them two-thirds of the wealth in the world, a great nation and a great company of nations. You may search history, study uh, geography, geopolitics, and you will find that the only peoples who suit this biblical description are the peoples of the United States and the British Commonwealth of Nations. So remember, Manasseh is a great people, Ephraim a multitude of nations. Okay? Yeah, from a Church of God booklet. Yes, yeah, Peter Salemis. I'm going to skip this part. So this is what I was going over uh, in 1 Chronicles 5, verse 2. It says, Yehuda, father of the Jews, prevailed above his brethren, and of him he became the chief ruler, Yeshua Messiah. Michael 5, verse 2, but the birthright was Joseph's. And I'm just going to just read what he states here. I think he does a beautiful job of explaining this. What was the birthright given to Joseph? The promises God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of national inheritance, becoming a nation and a company of nations. The promise of great material wealth, world power, possession of lands all over the world, and the possession of the gates of her enemies. And that's in, uh, let's, let's take a look at some of these scriptures. Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. It says that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies and we do today all right but we're losing those gates um and there's other scriptures that um see genesis chapter 26 genesis chapter 26 verses 3 to 5 sojourn in this land and i will be with thee and will bless thee for Unto thee and to thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swore unto um, Abraham thy father. And I will multiply thy seed. And so he gave these blessings. As the stars of heaven will give unto the seed all these countries, and in thy seed, sh in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and Torah. Okay, and we already went over um, 
Genesis 49, verse 22 to 26. So what is a birthright? Birthright, native right or privilege? Any right acquired by birth. A birthright is something which is one's right by birth. It has nothing to do with grace, which is unmerited pardon and a free gift, which is not one's right. It has to do with grace, not grace. Birthright possessions are customarily passed down from father to eldest son. So according to your Bible, the birthright promises were not passed on to the Jews. So the Jews aren't the richest nations in the world. You know who the richest nation in the world is right now, right? The United States and, and the British people before our, uh, World War II was the, the, the richest. But you know what happened, okay? But the Ephraim and Manasseh, the two tribes of, of, of um, Joseph. And so I already mentioned the scepter shall not depart from Judah, a whole series of dynasty of kings, and the promise of Yeshua Messiah is through that line of Judah, okay? I want you to focus on the kings. So that has everything to do with identifying who Ephraim is today. Where on the earth is, is, is there is a powerful monarchy historically, even today, it, 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 you can tell the power that this monarchy has. And this monarchy has a history of colonizing around the world. Who is that nation? It's the British Commonwealth, ladies and gentlemen. All right? um, and this is one of the best kept secrets uh, in biblical history. They should be teaching people about the British people today and that the fact that they are linked with the tribes of Israel, but they're not doing that. So fortunately, we have people like Yer Davidi, myself, Eddie Chumney, um, and others that are preaching the truth about this. And so anyway, the scepter promise. So let's focus on the scepter promise. And the divine right of kings. The royal houses in Europe intermarried extensively. The term divine right of kings stemmed from the former awareness of Jacob's and Nathan's prophecy about Yehuda and David, whose descendants were literally given a divine right to rule by God. The Encyclopedia Britannica states concerning the divine right of kings, the principle that the kingship is descendable in one sacred family is not only still that of the British Constitution, as that of all states, not only the legitimate monarchs derive their authority from God alone, but this authority is by divine ordinance, hereditary, and certain order of succession. All right, so that's what it means by race, not that we're being prejudiced, it's just that the type of human race. Um, all the people that have been sitting on, on the throne of David um, are Jewish, or they have, they have Jewish blood. So that, that's what that means. Up until, up until uh, today, Queen Elizabeth, believe it or not. And I'm going to prove that to you today. All right, so. So, you know, for some people, I know this may be shocking to you, but, you know, sometimes knowledge, <laughs> well, more often than not, knowledge can be shocking. Okay, so. Um, all right, so how else can we identify or try to identify Ephraim being part of um, Britain? Okay, so let's go over the nobility part, and then I'm going to go over another probably more simple part. The names Ephraim and Ephrathite connote nobility as remarked by the sages. And this is in Jeremiah 31, verse 20. This is in the, on the website, Britam.org. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, says the master. Rabbi Yeshua, Yeshua, well, that means Joshua in Hebrew, then Levi says the word Ephraim means someone who grew up in a palace, a noble, Rabbi um, Yeshua ben Nachman man says, the word Ephraim means a master and governor, says Rabbi Pinchas. Our forefather Yaakov, when he passed away, coronated Ephraim with a crown and made him the head of the tribes. The chief of the assembly, the most handsome and exalted of my descendants, would be called by his name. So the Midrash refers to the fact that the name Ephraim connotes nobility, as explained at length in our work Ephraim. I have that book. as a great book. Whereas Manasseh connotes represent, represent, uh, representative, accountable democracy. Ephraim dominates Britain, and Manasseh is prevalent in the United States. Ephraim nobility, the aristocratic principle of government, which involves royalty, still prevails in Britain, whereas the democratic principle is paramount in the United States. 
All right, so nobility. And then we talk about Ephraim becoming a multitude of nations. Manasseh shall be great, but truly his younger brother Ephraim shall be greater and his seed will become a multitude of nations. Abraham shall be a father of many nations. I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven and will give unto thy seed all these countries. I am the eternal Yodevahe, thy father, and of Isaac, the land where thou liest, to thee will I give it unto thy seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west to the east, to the north, and the south, to the ends of the earth. And they did. And it became a commonwealth of nations. Now you have right here Great Britain as Ephraim. The 24 flags displayed below represent territories, countries, islands, lands, and peoples that hold Queen Elizabeth as head of state. Some of the smaller islands have the same flag as the one listed below. This list does not include the countries that Britain forfeited or lost since its highest glory. Okay, so you have here listed and I know some of you may have heard of this, the old phrase, the sun never set on the British Empire, meaning that they had so much territory that the sun never set. There was always the sun setting somewhere because they, they had so much territory around the world. Okay? All right. And so we're going to talk about the Isles of the Sea. Now, we know that the British Isles is an island, okay? So the Bible says that the law of ten tribes will be in the Isles of the Sea, meaning the Isles west of the land of Israel and referring mainly to the British Isles. This indication must be taken in the context of other geographical signs of direction. The Isles of the Sea. The Bible describes Ephraim as the firstborn and also connects him with the Isles, the British Isles. Come on, folks. This is easy. If you focus, it really is. I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scatter of Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd of his flock. Similarly, Isaiah connects Israel with isles in the same passage of Isaiah that speaks of Britam, covenant of the people, and is connected with colonialism and the settlement of North America and Australia. Listen, O isles, unto me. Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified, to bring Yaakov again unto him, to raise up the tribes of Yaakov, a covenant of the people, he will be am, to establish the earth, to inherit the desolate heritages, those from the north and the west, and these from the land of Sinai. From Jerusalem, the British Isles is located northwest of Jerusalem. Just go ahead, take a map, and draw a line. It's located northwest of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, north and west. Take a line, take a map, draw a line all the way till you hit the British Isles. Other biblical references also appear to indicate that the lost tribes, a part of them, are in the Isles. Isaiah 24, verse 15, the name of the master of Israel in the Isles of the Sea. Remember, when Israel laid his hand, or Jacob laid his hand on Ephraim and Manasseh, he put his name on them. The name of the, uh, of the Lord. Yodevahi of Israel and the Isles of the Sea. The Isles shall wait for his Torah. And they're still waiting because they fully keep it. <laughs> By Isaiah 51, verse 4 to 5. Hearken unto me, my people, O oh, my nation. My arms shall judge the people. The Isles shall wait upon me. Surely the Isles shall wait upon me and the ships of Tarshish to bring thy sons from afar. And then Isaiah 11, verse 11. And the Hebrew also mentions the Isles of the Sea. In that day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time. This is the second exodus. To recover the remnant which is left of his people from Iberia, from Egypt, from Patros, from Ethiopia, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. These are the exiles of Yehuda in Israel. The places spoken of are areas to which the exiles were taken and from there went elsewhere. Okay, who... Uh, I'm still on there. Hope I didn't scare anybody. Oh, people are still on. Okay, I just want to make sure. <laughs> Not trying to scare you. All right, so here, let's, let's, uh, this is interesting here. Iberia, the lost ten tribes were exiled, exiled by Iberia. Some equate Iberia with Germany, and that's another Bible study altogether, but Iberia, a lot of Iberians ended up being Germans, okay? Egypt, in Hebrew, is Mitzrayim. Some of the lost tribes were exiled, exiled 
via Egypt, and so too were many of the Jews. The Celts of Britain and Ireland had early contacts with Egypt. Egypt, Mitzrayim, in Hebrew, in some contexts can also refer to Russia, which is interesting. That's another study. Patros is a place in Egypt, though some say a place on the Turkish border. Ethiopia in Hebrew is Kush. Kush could mean Africa in general, Sudan, Ethiopia, Afghanistan, India, and so forth. Kush was equated with Ethiopia. Homer uh, spoke of the Ethiopian in the east, in the far west. Okay. So, keep on hearing some clicks here. Anybody else is popping on? I guess not. All right. All right, so I hope this is, uh, Elam is an area in, in southwest Persia. Elam was once an important country. Um, Shinar, meaning Babylon, but also applied to northern shores of the Black Sea. All right, so anyway. And then uh, the, you read this, the coastlands of the sea. Everywhere else, the King James translates to Hebrew. And by the way, your Davidi, he's a, he's a uh, Orthodox Jew. Australian Jew, and he uses the King James Version a lot. He doesn't have a problem with it. I just want to state that, okay? And he knows why, because the King James Version was pretty much uh, translated accurately. Yeah. Everywhere else, the King James translates the Hebrew used here, Ayla Hayam, Hayam, the Isles of the Sea, and this is a more correct and is referring to the British Isles. Okay. And so the connection we have made between Isaiah 11.11 and the Law of Ten Tribes is confirmed by the Zohar, as we explain in our work, Ephraim, he will raise an ensign or for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth, outcasts of, uh, of Israel. So the lost ten tribes will be found gathered together in specific areas, dispersed of Yehuda, the Jews who are all scattered around the world. And then, of course, the jealousy of Ephraim, Britain shall depart, and those who harass well, actually, Ephraim in this context, as I explained last week, can refer to all the tribes. Ephraim shall not be jealous of Yehuda, and Yehuda shall not be harassed. Uh, Ephraim. Okay, so that should be a little clear. At least I hope it's clear to you as far as that's concerned. Now, let's take a look at... Where's the coat of arms here? Okay. Here's the, uh, the British coat of arms here. All right. Now, you're probably wondering, what does that mean at the bottom? It means, uh, this is, that's an old French word, and it means uh, God and my rights. So, again, they have the right to rule. That's what that means at the bottom. And, of course, the imagery is similar to the scriptures that I quoted. You have a unicorn, and then you have a lion, okay, which indicates that they have Jewish ancestry in that line, all right? And I was trying to find the, there's a chart that shows um, from the throne of David. Uh, basically, um, let me see if I can uh, find this website here. Uh, Hebrew Nations. Uh, Sons of David. So this is another website that you can go to. Um, Hebrew Nations. Okay, where is it? I just, Sons of David. Oh, man. I was just reading it earlier today. Let me see if I can find it. Let me see if I can find it again here. Sons of David. on this website here and I, I don't want to go through all this and I don't have enough time here uh, let's see monarchy okay throne of David let me just type in here throne of David maybe pop up here throne of David let's see here we go here we go all right. So right there, that's the scone of scone at the bottom. I'll talk about it in a future broadcast, okay? But I, that, I'm just going to focus on that. And then this is the, um, it's not the actual throne of David that David sat on, but it's symbolic of the throne of David, okay? And then that stone of scone. Many people believe, and I believe, that that's Jacob's pillar stone. Some people laugh at that. 
where there was a, um, a documentary on the History Channel proving that that is Jacob's Pillar Stone. Okay, that was talked about in Genesis chapter 28. And it's been preserved all to this time because uh, this is one scripture. Okay, I will do that. I will do that. I will send this to you later on. All right, so. It looks like Joseph popped off. All right. So getting back to this. Um, all right, so anyway, this... Jacob's Pillar Stone, that, that's another Bible study about that. All right, so rule by the sons of David. All right, so in the future, the descendants of King David and the Levites will, exceedingly, will be exceedingly numerous. The seed of Jacob will return, and the seed of David will rule over them. This is in Jeremiah 33, verse 22. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measure, so will I multiply the seed of David, my servant, and the Levites that minister unto me. Okay. David was promised that the rulership over Israel, or at least part of it, will come from him. This is what we wrote in the commentary in Jeremiah. Um, in Jeremiah 33, verse 23, um, And moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Consider thou not what this people has spoken, saying, The two families which the Lord has chosen, he hath even cast them off. Those two families is the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Thus they have despised my people, that they should be no more a nation before them. Thus says the Lord, If my covenant be not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinance of heaven and earth, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and David, my servant, so that I will not take any of his seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will cause their captivity to return and have mercy on them. And so, literally speaking, the promises to David, let me uh, brighten this up a little bit here. Literally speaking, the promises to David and to the Levites, and let me... So you can see that here, all these scriptures, so you can jot these, down, jot these down. Okay, so literally speaking, the promises to David and to the Levites do not necessarily mean that they will always have rulers and ministers over the house of Israel. Rather, the biblical promises may be understood to state that the descendants of David and Levi will always be available to fulfill their ancestral functions whenever the promised messianic order shall be instituted or whenever the children of Israel are worthy. Even so, it may be that many of the rulers over the exiled Israelites and those who ministered to them in Britain, America, and elsewhere are and were descended from the houses of David and Levi. The verse does not have to be taken literally in our time, but rather as applicable to the future. Nevertheless, the verse could best be understood to say that throughout the history of these peoples, they will be ruled over by descendants of David. This is, in effect, what has occurred is partially explained in our work, Ephraim, which is a good book. So the house of David and the lost tribes. Jeremiah 33, verse 14. The days come that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. Again, there are two houses. Actually, there's three houses because God is concerned about all the nations too. All right, so he's providing salvation to everyone. Whenever I teach this and when other people, they seem to think that I'm just focusing on just um, Israel only. No, I'm focusing on everyone because in the end, the overall goal, and I explain this in my book, Overall goes for all of us to become spiritual Israel, the Israel of God. That's in Galatians chapter 15 and 16. But despite that, we can't ignore the fact that God blessed Israel to be very prosperous and have the best. And we, if we want to grow in grace and knowledge, and when we want to understand the prophecies, we should have the desire to want to understand these things. And we shouldn't say, what has this got to do with salvation? Well, <clears throat> What about following tradition? What does that got to do with salvation? Okay, so, so you know, there's other things that we can say. What does that got to do with salvation? And yet we do it. And so anyway, will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up into David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land? David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of Israel. And some people say, well, that prophecy hasn't been fulfilled. Well, yes, it has, okay? And it's, it's being fulfilled all the way up into Queen Elizabeth. Uh, David had numerous sons. Solomon, the son of David, had 300 wives and 700 concubines and children were born to him. And so most of the kings of the house of David had several children, each of whom also would have raised a family of his own. It follows that numerous offspring on the male side must have belonged to the house of David. 
descent through the male is what scripture, strictly speaking, requires in order for the descendants to call themselves by the house of their male ancestor, even though in Jewish law anyone born of a Jewish mother is considered Jewish. The house of David reigned in Judah, and quite a few families among the present-day Jews trace themselves back to David. And so that scripture can say someone existing, whether it is a king or a queen, and there was a few. There was one queen of Israel, uh, the house of Israel, and there was one queen. Um, which link? The link to this? Okay. Uh, this is going to be in the video, so but you can you can actually type in the link here if you want. Uh, I guess I can put it up in here. Here we go. There we go. All right, so numerous people from the tribe of Judah also exiled together with the lost ten tribes. The sons of David had once been appointed administrators over Israel. Later, members of the house of David had intermarried with leaders of the northern kingdom and passed over to live in those areas. And this and, and other ways, the descendants of David must have penetrated the ranks of the exiled Israelites. Well, I can't see it on this side to copy. Okay. All right, so anyway, it'll be, it'll be uh, in the video. Uh, an Aramaic inscription mentions the house of David somehow in connection with Dan and the Galilee. So anyway, a part of the lost ten tribes became known. Okay, I'm not going to read that. Okay. Another font of the Davidic line may have penetrated Western European nobility through France. There was once a semi-autonomous principality in Narbonne, described by Arthur J. Zuckerman. It was ruled by a Jewish prince of the House of David, whose offspring intermarried with the um, royal line of France, aristocracy, and the royal line of France and those with that of Normandy, Scotland, and England. Among the Welsh, Scottish, English, and other groups in Europe, there were families who believed they descended from the King, King David of Yehuda. There is strong tradition, and it's not just tradition as a fact. I know some people laugh about this, but it can be proven. That T. Tepi, a princess of the house of David, came to Ireland, married a prince of the line of Nau, and from this union emerged the monarchs of Scotland and later of all Britain. Genealogists believe that many presidents of the United States belong to British and Israel royal lines. Okay, <clears throat> this is something that you can certainly research. Okay, all right. Okay, I just want to make sure. All right, so I think we understand that now. I want to show you guys. Um, there's a saying in, in the Bible, and this is probably perhaps the easiest way that I could uh, further clarify this. Okay? Who popped back on? Yeah, I guess that's Joseph. Okay. All right, so... I know I don't know if you guys ever heard of that anthem before. God save the king. Of course, it's God save the queen right now. But do you know that the Bible records that that's how the kings of Israel were coronated in the Bible? Okay. And so let me let me show this to you. Okay. And so you have here, first of all, First Samuel ten verse twenty four. 1 Samuel 10, verse 24. And Samuel said unto all the people, See ye him whom the Lord has chosen, that there is none like him among the people. And everyone said, God save the king. So that's how they, they just went out and just said that. All right? And I tell you, whenever I talk about this, it's just astounding. <laughs> And Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, came to Jerusalem, and it came to pass when uh, the archite, David's friend, was coming to Absalom, and he said, God save the king. God save the king. Okay. So let's continue on here. First Kings chapter 25. Verse 24 here. And Nathan said, My lord, O king, hast thou said, Adon, Adonijah shall reign after me. Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne. For he is gone this day and has slain oxen, 
and fat cattle and sheep and all that. And they eat and drink before him and, and say, God save the king at Zenaja. Okay, so we're seeing this God save the king concept all throughout here. And then Zadok the priest. And let say okay, in verse 33, the king also said unto them, Take with you the service of your Lord and call Solomon my son to ride upon my own mule and bring him down to Gion. Okay, and let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him there, king over Israel, and bow ye with the trumpet and say, God save Solomon, God save King Solomon. Okay? And so this was part of the coronation of Israel. I want you to understand that. They stated, God saved the king. Where in the world do they do that today? Where in the world do they have an anthem that says, God saved the king? Right now it's queen. But when there's a king, it's king. Okay? And then verse 35, Then he shall come up after him, that he may come and sit upon my throne, for he shall be king in my stead. And I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. And so, in verse, 1 Kings 1, verse 39, he says, And Zadok the priest took a horn out of the tabernacle, and anointed Solomon, and they blew the trumpet, and all the people said, God save King Solomon. And that's what the British people do today. They've been always been doing that. Ever since they've been coronating. They coronate the king. They say, God save the king. And the few times they coronated a queen, God save the queen. That is one of the most, this is one of the most marvelous proofs that Britain is Ephraim and they are a part of Israel. All throughout the scriptures, God saved the king. God saved the king. That was part of the coronation of Israel. And so that is one of the easiest ways that I can prove this, ladies and gentlemen. And so what we're going to do, I have some... Uh, have a recording here and see if I can find it here. And it's so beautiful. What I suggest you guys do is look at the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. There's so much biblical stuff in there. It's not even funny. Look at the coronation of... Um, where is it at here? I put it on here somewhere. Here we go. Coronation of Queen Elizabeth. All right. Um, I have the short version here. Here's the coronation of King George. Let me play it here. I'm not going to play the whole thing. I just want you guys to... All the world looks towards London, and half the world seems to be here on this day of day. The day that will write a new page in history. The day that will be remembered by the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Look at the royalty. The aristocracy. That's, that's what it's all about. Kings shall come out of it. Today's first excitement is the motor car procession of the foreign representatives, which leaves for the Abbey before nine o'clock. Every moment the thrill of excitement increases. Innumerable field glasses, cameras, and telescopes. Let me go to the part where he's... Here we go. So look at all this. This royalty. That's just where you got it from. It's safe. Long may it rest there. of his majesty the king.
That's the throne, and you have the scone and scone right underneath it. His Majesty is greeted by the Westminster scholars with a vivac wreck. This was a dual coronation. It was the coronation of, of King George and then the, and um, I think it was Queen Elizabeth. Not Queen Elizabeth II, but another Or Queen Victoria, I think. I don't know. I now, did you hear what he just said there? His Majesty is greeted by the Westminster scholars with a high net break. God save King George. There you go. So they yell, say, God save King George. They got that from the Bible. That identifies that the British people are of Israel. Thus, the 8,000 people inside the Abbey first acclaim their sovereign. Then His Majesty will go to the chair of the state to take the coronation oath. Meanwhile, the regalia, which have been carried by the lords in the procession, are placed by the Dean of Westminster upon the altar. The King prepares to take the oath. The Archbishop asks him if he will solemnly promise to govern of the people of Great Britain, Ireland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the Union of South Africa, of your possession and the other territories to any of them belonging or containing, and of your empire of India, according to their respective laws and customs. I found this something, sir. Yes, do. Will you be your power for your justice in mercy to be executed in all your judgments? I will. Still sitting in the chair of the state, the king signs the oath. Twice he dips his pen in the ink. Now he will disrobe for the most sacred part of the service, the anointing with holy oil. Anointing with holy oil. We'll bring the canopy of copper and gold. I wonder where we got that from. This is prophecy come alive, folks. It's something I should not have withheld, but I guess it's the right time to start revealing this now. Now, where did we get that from? That's a sukkah, right? A hoopah, that's right, hoopah, sorry. A hoopah. Jewish is all up in this. After the anointing, 
the secular and sacred characters of the coronation merge. The super tunica, or the overdress of cloth of gold, is put upon the king. A girdle of the same material is caught around his waist. The girdle around the waist. The Lord Chamberlain touches his heels with the golden spurs of knighthood. From the altar, the Archbishop brings the jeweled sword of state. That is symbolized in the king, the merging of the temporal and divine power. Receive this king the sword, brought now from the altar of God, and delivered to you by the hands of us, the bishops and servants of God, though unworthy. The sword is dead about the king by the Lord Great Chamberlain. This sword do justice, come the growth of iniquity, protect the holy church of God, help and defend widows and orphans, and so faithfully serve our Lord Jesus Christ in this life, that we may reign forever with him in the life which is to come. The king ungirds the sword, and bearing towards the altar, Opposite in the scabbard to the Archbishop. The peer who first receives the sword redeems it for the price of 100 shillings, and during the remainder of the service he carries it naked before the king. Exactly. The armil or collar is placed on the king by the Dean of Westminster. That throne has been preserved as the scriptures the indicate. Him with a mantle of cloth of gold. Through the line of David. Square like the cope of a bishop, and richly adorned with the eagle of empire. Yeah, I think this is almost done. I'm not going to put this whole thing. The orb with the cross. Receive this imperial robe and all, and the Lord your God endure you with knowledge and wisdom, with majesty and with power from on high. The sovereign receives the ring, a great sapphire slashed with a cross of ruby. Sapphire. The Lord of the Manor of Workshop presents the glove. His Majesty takes the scepter with the cross. The scepter. The of his power, and the scepter with the dove. The scepter. The of divine guidance. And the scepter. Now every eye is riveted on the St. Edward's crown as the Archbishop of Canterbury lifts it from the altar and the Dean of Westminster bears it to where the King sits in the coronation chair. So he's getting ready to be crowned. The Bishop of Canterbury takes it, raises it with solemnity, lowers it on the royal brow. The king is crowned. The peers acclaim their sovereign. God save the king. King leaves the austere coronation chair to take his golden throne for the homage. All the great officers of state group in dazzling array around the sovereign. In their majestic sweeping robes, heirs of the realm will pay homage one by one at the feet of King George VI, then rise one by one to touch his majesty's crown and kiss his left cheek. First the Archbishop, then the Duke of Gloucester, the Duke of Kent, and the... All right, so that is the, the coronation of King... George, and you saw a lot of biblical references in that. I don't know for the life of me why. I, I don't know. This is the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. Uh, I'm not going to play the whole thing here, but it's 
No, I don't know. They don't do this under the Roman Catholic Church. No, no. I mean, this is totally. Uh, uh, no, no, this, this is uh, they don't do a coronation for the pope like this. I mean, uh, they don't do that. On the way, down the mall, past Trafalgar Square, move along the Thames Embankment. You'll see very short, very part of the world awaits the arrival of her And we'll see very shortly the procession as it passes right up the great church. And as they pass into the coronation theater, there before them will lie the great altar with all its massive plate arrayed upon it. Dominating the whole, there stands on the small dais that you see, the throne. And below the throne, there stands King Edward's chair. The old, warm chair in which for centuries kings have been crowned. That is the throne of David. Not the literal throne that he sat on, but symbolic. And then, of course, underneath that is the stone of scone. It's called the Stone of Israel in the Bible that's been preserved for thousands of years. Um, anyone that understands anything about British history understands that. Um, and then there's a doc. If you guys think that's funny or think I don't know what I'm talking about, go and look. Uh, there's a documentary on the History Channel that proves that the Stone of Scone is actually Jacob's Pillar Stone. So, so um, that's what you need to do is, is to do some research on that. But um, this is uh, I proved this over and over and over again. This is certainly the actual pillar stone uh, of Jacob. And the reason why it has to be so, ladies and gentlemen, is that the Messiah has to return to a literal symbolic throne, okay? And so in Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, verse 32, it says, He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest, and the master shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So that throne has to exist today. And that throne is located in the British Isles today. All right. Symbolic of the Jacob pillar stone of the, uh, underneath old, the old throne of King Edward's chair or throne. And so um, that is truth. I know some people laugh at that and all that, but uh, the Bible tells us that the whole world has been deceived too. So we, we got to take a look at that. That means every facet of society has been deceived, including uh, history. And so uh, when you want to understand prophecy, you have to understand history. And so, um, but I'm going to do a separate study on the throne of David because I know there's a lot of skeptics out there. They just don't believe that, just like they don't believe that the Sabbath day is, it should be Saturday instead of Sunday. So, um, but I'm, I'm going to definitely uh, give a detailed study on that as well, an irrefutable study. I've done my research over the years. And I don't know if, um, you know, Eddie Chomney goes over the throne of David, but I'm going over it. And uh, I, I think it's very important. It's a real simple way to prove that Ephraim is Britain. Although Ephraim can also represent all the other ten tribes as well, which I uh, have talked about. And so um, I think that will end this Bible study. Um, this, again, was designed to be an introductory lesson to helping you understand that Ephraim consists of the British people, that the monarchy part of the tribes of Israel um, certainly has something to do with Ephraim. And then, of course, um, Ephraimites mixing with Yehuda, and everyone that's sitting on the, king of, the throne of David must have Jewish ancestry, and they do all the way from Queen Elizabeth. Okay. And so... Um, I just hope that this, this Bible study benefits you. And there we go. We're looking at that throne again, that throne that the Messiah is going to come back and get. He's going to get there, believe it or not. <laughs> the Bible says that he's going to right here. It says he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And, and the master shall give him unto the throne of his father, David. So he, he's going to have that throne. Um, and, uh, He's going to rule over it. 
All right, so I'm going to end this uh, recording.